Hey, you guys can have a seat. Uh, several years ago, I used to go speak at a, a nursing facility every week. And one day I got up to speak. And as soon as I stepped towards the, the front to speak, there's this elderly lady that screamed out, sit down, we want to sing. I kind of feel like I understand why she felt that way right now, because that was amazing, amazing worship this morning. But um, if we haven't met, my name's Jeremy. I have the privilege of being the director of students here at Wiregrass. That means I get to hang out with our middle school and high school students. And I've been doing that at different places across South Alabama and Northwest Florida for 23 years. And one of my favorite things about working with students is getting to go on these incredible trips with them in the summer. And one of my favorite trips of all time took place just a few years ago. We decided we wanted to do something a little different, do something we had never done, something I'd never done, is to take a mission trip to a Native American reservation. So we kind of researched that and we found an organization that would take us up to uh, Montana, to Hart Butte, Montana, to work with a Native American people group. So as we planned out our trip, we realized that there was this incredible national park not far from where we were gonna serve. So we flew in to Kalispell, Montana, and we drove through Glacier National Park. It's the most beautiful place I've ever been. I've been to Alaska on mission trips. I've been to the Caribbean, by far the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. And as we went through, we went through this road called the Going to the Sun Road. This road is only open uh, about two months out of the year because the snow covers it during most of the year. So we planned out our trip knowing that we didn't have a lot of time, but we did want to make sure we made the trip through there to see what we could see. So as we went through the road, I'm going to show you a few pictures of my favorite places. If you were to fly into Kalispell and go in through the West Gate uh, into the park, you would come to Lake McDonald, which was absolutely incredible. As you pulled up and you got out of your vehicle and you looked out across this incredible lake, I mean, crystal clear glacier water, those rocks are like super red and bright. It's incredible. Just Beautiful, beautiful scenery. And as we went on through the park, we got to the very center of the park. It's right where the Continental Divide is. This is called Hidden Lake Overlook. So what happens is you get out, you have to get there really, really early, and you get out at the visitor center, and you go through the visitor center, go out the back, and then there is this long, wide uh, boardwalk that winds up and through all this beautiful scenery all the way till you get to this point right here. I mean, it is by far the most popular and well-traveled uh, hike in the park because it's easy. Like it's super, super easy. I mean, anybody, uh, the difficulty is really, really low and you get to this overlook and you look down onto this lake and these mountains and normally you can go down to the lake and explore down there. But when we were there, uh, what had happened, they had closed it because of grizzly activity, bear activity, which I thought was lame because we spent a lot of money on bear spray and I was convinced that there were at least two students in our group I could outrun. So I was not worried at all about bears. I felt like I could beat at least two of them. But it was an incredible place going out the east side of the gate. Uh, we were like in a hurry trying to get to our place and we saw this. This is uh, Goose Island right out here. This is Goose Island. But it's just absolutely stunning. Just the most beautiful place you've, you've ever seen. It's just like amazing. Uh, so we went there and we went on and served at our mission trip and did some incredible things, had a great trip. But when we came back, I made the mistake of getting on Facebook and finding the Glacier National Park fan page. This is like where everybody that's ever been or ever wants to go, this is what they go to to find out how to plan their trip and share pictures. When I got on this, like every day people are posting. And when I would see all these posts, I'm like, man, I want to go on that hike. Because there's, there's this one picture I want to show you. This is from the summit of one of the highest mountains looking down on one of these lakes, these glacier lakes. It's just incredible. But what you realize is when a person gets up that high to that spot, they're one of few people that have ever stood in that place. 
Because it's not easy. It's not like the path that we took to get to the Hidden Lake Overlook uh, Trail. That was not, it was nothing like that. When you read about these hikes, they always say we started out at this trailhead and we went about 11 miles and then we followed a goat trail and we eventually climbed this rock face and it was just on and on and on because it's just really difficult. There are paths, there are hikes in Glacier National Park that are really, really easy to do. And then there are some that are extremely difficult and dangerous. And when I think about that, I think about the, the passage of scripture that we're gonna look at this morning where Jesus talks about two different paths that we can choose in life. And the really amazing thing about this is this is the very end of Jesus's longest sermon that we have recorded in the Bible. You know it as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's three chapters long in Matthew 5 through 7. It's an incredible passage of scripture where Jesus teaches on one subject after the other. It is like a gold mine when it comes to, to studying this passage. And most theologians believe that it could have been a, ser a summary of a series of sermons that Jesus made over several hours or possibly even several days. I mean, it is incredible. The, the earliest and, and longest sermon that we have recorded of Jesus in the Bible. And when he gets to the very end of the sermon, he ends it with four different sections. It's just 15 verses, four different sections, and all four sections point to the same truth. And we're only gonna look at one of them today but it's incredibly powerful what Jesus has to say about the path that we choose in life. So we're gonna look at this first passage of scripture in Matthew chapter seven, verse 13. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. And we're gonna talk about what the narrow gate is in just a minute. But he says, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. That's what Jesus says first. So if you look at a summary of that, this graphic kind of explains the progress. There's a wide gate, huge. Think of a huge city gate. And when you go in that gate, it's a broad path. It's wide. There's room for a lot of people. And therefore, a lot of people enter through that path. But he warns people that that path, even though it's popular, leads to destruction. And you do have to understand when you read all four sections where Jesus uh, closes with the same point, he's not just talking about, well, your hopes and dreams for life won't work out. That's not what he's talking about, although that's true. He's talking about the end of your life that everyone spends eternity somewhere, that your path that you choose in life ends up in one of two places. And he says, this is the first option. But the good news is he goes on and he says, but, that's a good thing, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. So he said there's this wide path, this, this big gate that you can go through, but also there is a narrow gate that you can walk through. So when you compare the two in this graphic right here, you can see there's two choices. There's no third option according to Jesus. There's these two choices. Enter through a wide gate that's popular, it's broad, many people find it, but it leads to destruction. Or you can choose to enter through the, the small gate and walk down the narrow path. Few people find that path, but that path leads to eternal life. That's what Jesus says after he has preached this long sermon. He reminds everyone that has heard the sermon there are two paths, and today you have to choose. And see, the truth is we all do. We all get the opportunity to choose what path we're on. And some of us don't even realize we're on a path. But Jesus says there's only two paths. And the truth is your life is headed somewhere. Your life is headed somewhere, either on the wide path or the narrow path. One leads to destruction and one leads to life. Those are the words of Jesus, our Savior, that we celebrate today. So if that's true, the question that I think all of us would ask is simply this, how, 
how do I know if I'm on the narrow path that leads to life? Because some of us have grown up our whole lives in church. I grew up going to First Baptist Church, Sampson, Alabama. That's where I grew up. And, you know, I, I've always considered myself a follower of Jesus. But the question for some of us is, how do I know? if I'm on the narrow path that leads to life. And there's some people in the room, because it's Easter and your mama asked you to come, you came, even though you don't know if you believe it, or some of you would say, well, I don't, I'm just not sure where I stand. The question for you is, what do I need to do to get on the narrow path that leads to life? Because you would say, I'm not on it right now. I mean, there's some of us in the room that would say that, that it's obvious to everybody around me that I'm not on the right path. And if I choose to go down that path, that narrow path, how do I do that? That's the question that we've got to ask. So what I want to do for just a few moments, I want to take a step back. And remember, this passage of scripture we just looked at is from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And some of you know that the Sermon on the Mount opens with a section of scripture called the Beatitudes, You remember, blessed are the people that do this and this and this. That's what he opens with. Well, when you think about this message that Jesus gave, the idea that Jesus lays out for the narrow narrow path and the narrow way is seen from the very beginning of this passage of Scripture. So we're going to start with the very first beatitude and look at this really quick. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the first thing that we've got to realize is, is that blessed does not mean, it does not mean happy. Most of us think that blessed means happy. It does not. Jesus is not declaring how people feel. When he says blessed are the poor in spirit, he's not talking about how you and I feel. Jesus is actually making a statement about what God thinks about them. When he says someone's blessed in the Beatitudes, he's talking about God's opinion of them. So the best way to understand what this means is that blessed means approved by God, which hopefully if you're in the room, you want that. You want God to look at your life and be like, I'm good with that person. Like they're living the life they're supposed to. They have made the choice that they should make. So that's what we've got to understand as we look at this very quickly that blessed means approved by God. So what does it mean when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Because what I want you to understand is, when Jesus teaches this, it's as if he is saying, the first two beatitudes are the post that the gate hangs on. That if you're wanting to go down the narrow path, if you're gonna enter the narrow gate, then these are the two side posts that hold up the gate that have to be true of you if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. So poor in spirit, and we don't have time to go in this in real depth, but it really means that poor in spirit is the personal acknowledgement, only you can make this decision, of spiritual bankruptcy. It is the awareness and admission that I am sinful and without any ability to earn God's approval. That's what it means. The picture that they would have gotten in Jesus's day would would have been a beggar standing outside of this huge city gate, which was very popular. And these beggars that were blind or lame or whatever, they had no ability to provide or care for themselves apart from the help of someone else. They would have been completely bankrupt. They had nothing to offer. They totally relied on other people for their care and survival. So what Jesus is saying is, if you and I want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, if we want to have eternal life, the first thing that has to be true of us, the first side post to enter into the narrow path is to understand that when you and I stand before God, We have no ability on our own to be good enough to earn God's forgiveness. And I'm telling you, as a guy that has grown up in this area most of my life, the biggest misconception that people that go to church and that don't go to church have is that if you ask them, do you think that you'll go to heaven when your time on earth is done? Most people will say yes. And if you ask them, well, why do you believe that's true? 
in some form, they would say, well, I'm a good person. I go to church, I was baptized, I prayed a prayer, I don't do these things, I do these things I'm supposed to do. But what Jesus taught in the very first part of his sermon was that if you wanna enter God's kingdom, you have to first of all admit there is no way that you can be good enough to earn forgiveness or salvation or eternal life. You can't. That if you're gonna be saved, if you're gonna be forgiven of your sin, you need help from someone outside of yourself. That's the first thing that Jesus taught. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. Now, really quick, the first beatitude describes our spiritual condition before God, but the second beatitude is linked to it. It describes the appropriate response we should have when we realize our spiritual condition before God. So what he says next, he says, first of all, blessed or approved by God are, are people that admit they're poor in spirit. Second of all, when they realize that they're, they have no ability to be good enough or earn God's salvation, there is a brokenness. When he says you mourn, that means you're broken over your sin, that you can't save yourself. There's nobody that's gonna stand before God one day and say, well, obviously I was good enough. I did all these things, God. Because no matter what you do, the Bible says that no one, this is what it says verbatim, no one will be declared righteous or right with God by keeping the law. So the two side posts are, you have to admit that you're a sinner that cannot save yourself and there's brokenness over your sin. That's what it means when he says this, this next beatitude, when he says that, that we've got to mourn over our, our um, condition. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be Comforted, And the idea of this, if you had to summarize it, is this, the next one. The idea of that passage is approved by God are those who are broken over their sin for they shall be comforted. That God will comfort them because they can be forgiven. Now, here's the question. If these are the side posts, if Jesus from the very beginning of the sermon says, these are the two side posts, the question is, what is the gate? Because Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. So what is the gate? Well, the good news is Jesus clearly told us what the gate was. In John chapter 10, this is what he says. John 10, seven, he says, therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. That's what Jesus said. He said, if you want to know what the gate is to eternal life, to forgiveness, to being right with God, it's him. That you have to come before God and say, I am broken, I am a sinner, and I cannot earn God's salvation. And then you have to come over here and you have to admit, after you've admitted your condition, that you are broken, you are sorry for your sin that you wanna change, that you want God to change your life. But whenever they saw this idea that when Jesus said, I am the gate, they would have seen this picture of what is called a sheep pen or a sheep fold. They were all over um, Israel in Jesus's day. And what would happen was, is a good shepherd, which is what Jesus de describes himself as, would lead the sheep in here at night and there is no door. You notice that there's no door to shut. There's no hinges. But what would happen was, is a good shepherd would sit right here in the entrance and they would become the gate. They would keep the sheep in to protect them at night. And then they would lead their sheep out to graze and to find water. So what Jesus is simply saying is this. If you want to be forgiven of your sin, if you want to be made right with God, if you want to have eternal life when this life is over, he says, you have to come before God admitting your sin and your brokenness. You have to come to the point that you're broken over your sin and you regret it. But the good news is what the Bible says is when Jesus says, I am the gate, literally what he is saying is that what Jesus accomplished through his life, 
Because the truth of scripture is that Jesus came from heaven to earth to live the life you and I could never live. That he lived, the Bible said, a sinless life. That he chose to trust God and obey. He faced every temptation and every struggle that you and I will ever face. And he always trusted God and obeyed. And then he willingly went to the cross and took the punishment that you and I deserve for our sin. The Bible actually says that he, Jesus, who was without sin, became sin for us. It's as if Jesus absorbed our punishment that we deserve for our sin. It's like someone stepping in front of you to keep you from being injured. That's the picture that scripture gives is that through Jesus's life, death, and today we celebrate his resurrection. That Jesus, through what he accomplished on the cross, defeated sin and death once and for all. And for anybody, no matter what you've done, how bad it is, no matter what other people think about you, the truth of scripture is this, is that anyone that comes to God and say, God, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. There's no way. If I'm gonna have eternal life, if I'm gonna be forgiven, then that help has to come from Jesus. And I'm broken over my sin. I wanna change, God, would you change me? And we put our trust not in our ability to be good enough, because we can't be good enough but we put our trust in the fact that Jesus lived the life that you and I could not live. He died the death we deserved, took the punishment we deserved, and God raised him from the dead on the third day, proving once and for all that God accepted his sacrifice for our sin. The Bible says that anyone that does that can be forgiven and be made right. And that's good news for all of us. And some of you are in this room because it's Easter and someone asks you to come and you just feel weird about it. But the truth is, no matter where you are with God, today you can choose to step away from the broad path that leads to destruction. You can choose to walk away from what everybody at your school is doing or everybody at your work is doing, and you can choose to live differently. You can choose to put your trust in what Jesus did through his life, death, and resurrection, and you can become a new person. And that is the offer for everyone this morning. So if you're here and you've never done that, or if you're here and you grew up in church and somebody told you to do something different, somebody said, just believe these things, pray that prayer and then come to church, but you've never really put your trust in Jesus. You think it's about how good you are and your ability to be a good person. The Bible says that's not, that's not any good. That if we stand before God and say, God, look at my good deeds. The end of the Bible actually says that one day when we stand before God, the books will be open, the books that contain all of our deeds. There's not a single person that has ever lived on planet earth besides Jesus that can be declared right with God because of what they did in their life. But it also says after that, the book is open. The book of life, the people the names of the people that had put their trust in Jesus, that he was good enough, that he took our place and God raised him from the dead to prove that he overcame our greatest enemy, sin and death. So that's what I have to offer you this morning is you can have forgiveness, a relationship with God and eternal life through what Jesus has done for you. We're about to sing a song and we're not gonna ask you to come forward, but I do want you to know this. After this song is over down front, there's some of our pastors gonna be down here. We'll stay as long as we need. We'd love to talk to you about what it looks like to follow Jesus. So as I pray, I just want you to consider what path you're on. What gate have you walked through? And here, here's another thing. I've got five kids 
And I've been in student ministry for 23 years. And there's one thing that I do know that is true is that most kids end up on the path they're on because they follow their parents there. That's a lot of pressure, parents. So consider where are you leading your children? Husbands, where are you leading your family? Because your sons and your daughters are gonna walk the same path you walk. So are you on the path that leads to destruction or are you on the path that leads to eternal life? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know every heart in this room. You know every heart of every person watching online. And God, right now, my first prayer is that you would give people courage to consider what path they've chosen in life. And God, I pray that you would give them the courage to block out the voices that are telling them there's no way they can change. There's no way God can forgive them. God, would you remove those voices and let your spirit assure them that they can be made new today. They can be forgiven. They can have eternal life with you. God, we pray on this this Easter morning, God, that, that their lives would be resurrected to be new people that live for you, that trust in you. And God, we pray that in this room, there are entire families that will begin following after you and trusting you and not their ability to be good enough. God, we don't need religion. We need our faith to be in you. So God, work in our hearts. God, challenge us. Give us courage. Give us wisdom. And show us how to lead the next generation. It's in the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.